and Kronika on KMVT. Our show is being taped on Thursday, January 13th, 2005. My guest today is Seth Shostak. He is an author and astronomer, and we're really happy to have him on the show. It's Welcome. a real pleasure, Fred. It's great to have you here. The, uh, we, sh we should first say that you are also uh, a host here uh, of a show at KMVT, uh, uh, Face to Face, and right? Yeah, th th that is right, actually, <laughs> yes. KMVT uh, has been uh, uh, taping this show, that is to say Face to Face, for many, many years now. Has it? Yeah. It's and has it's been fun. Has it, and how did you hear about that? How did you uh, get into television? Well, there's a whole history there which is suitably uh, stultifying, but in <laughs> fact, I used to be involved with Channel 27, which was the City of Mountain View's own cable access station, okay. only really for the city uh, council meetings mm -hmm. and for a very small amount of programming. And there, there was a Channel 27 News, I think was the name of our show. Okay. And it was watched by three cats and two dogs who <laughs> accidentally tripped on the, uh, <laughs> the remote and turned on the channel. And uh, when that station was abandoned in favor of consolidation with this channel, mm -hmm. uh, the show was picked up over here and we expanded it and uh, it's still running. And you're still running. And that seems to be a long way from what your day job is over at SETI, which is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. How, how, does, how, did, that, um, how did you get interested in television, doing television? Well, actually, yeah, my interest in television goes back a long way, a very long way. When I was 11 years old, I started making films. And they were 8-millimeter for the first couple of years, and then 16-millimeter films. We made student films. All this was soft, sophomoric drivel, really. Um, in okay. fact, we, we started off making rather serious films, uh, mm -hmm. I think back on it. And uh, by the third film, it was very clear that our attempts at making serious drama were <laughs> fatally flawed. <laughs> People were laughing at what we made, and so we thought, well, if they're going to laugh, let's make comedies. Mm -hmm. So we did that. And then, of course, uh, as video picked up, I developed an interest in that. So. I think it's sort of a natural interest. To be quite honest, uh, my my career, such uh, as it is, uh -huh. and unpaid as it is, uh, with Channel 20, uh, KMBT and Channel 27, its predecessor, actually predate my employment with the SETI Institute. So oh, I've been doing it longer than I've worked at the Institute, yes. Interesting. Well, let's talk a little bit about your background. I mean, you you went to Princeton, and you, you studied physics there. Yes. And then you uh, got a PhD at uh, California Institute of Technology, s and, you s and you studied astronomy there. Tell us about how did you get interested in, in physics and astronomy? Well, I, you know, I was kind of a techno nerd when I was a kid. And I suppose I still am in some ways. <laughs> I, I still have the hat with the propeller on it. Uh, <laughs> but I got interested in astronomy. Uh, like most people, I think, you, I, I, it's my, my belief that whatever you're interested in as mm -hmm. an adult is something that uh, uh, stimulated your interest when you were eight or nine years old. I, I think most people would admit to that. Right. And when I was eight years old, I was looking through a book that my parents had that was an atlas. And in the back, there was this funny diagram mm -hmm. with a bunch of circles. And I asked my mom, what is this? And she said, oh, well, those, those are planets. Uh -huh. I'd never heard the word before. And then she <laughs> kind of explained what they were. And uh, then uh, you know, I took myself to a planetarium and stuff like that. So that, that's when I got interested in astronomy. I had a Okay. telescope by age 10, which I would occasionally use to look at the sky and the rest of the time look at the neighbors. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so it's, an, it's a very old uh, interest of mine. When I went to Caltech as a grad student, they had all these big pictures of the <laughs> Palomar telescope on the walls there, and that was entirely too romantic for me to pass up. Right, right. That's fantastic. Um, let's see. You're, um, among other things, a physicist, astronomer. You're also, sounds like you're part biologist, because as I look at your book here, a book called uh, Sharing the Universe. This, is, this was written in 1998, I believe. Yes. And w what else have you written since then? Well, there have been, been two books since. One mm -hmm. is called Cosmic Company. That's mm -hmm. a more recent book, which I wrote together with uh, Alex Barnett, who's now the uh, director, in fact, of the or CEO, I guess is the correct title, mm -hmm. of the Chabot Space and Science Center over in o Oakland. Okay. And in between those two books, uh, I co-authored a textbook on a subject called astrobiology, mm -hmm. which is actually a big industry insofar <laughs> as it's ever a big industry, here right. in the City of Mountain View at NASA Ames Research Center and at the SETI Institute. Mm -hmm. And that textbook is uh, for college students, mostly first-year college students. Mm -hmm. There are numerous courses on this subject, astrobiology, around the country today, and I suspect there'll be more tomorrow. Right. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, I got a chance to read a little bit of, bit of the book, and it's just, you're actually a very good writer, for one. It's very entertaining. You really take a subject and, and bring it down to earth, so to speak. And um, maybe you can talk a little bit about SETI, this, this whole idea of, you know, what SETI is, the, a little bit of the history, how it got started, and how did you end up at SETI? Well, yeah, SETI, uh, as you say, stands for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. 
it's kind of an old idea, you know. You look up at the night sky and you sort of wonder, well, is there something up there that might be looking back? <laughs> whatever. And, and, and that idea goes back actually to the ancient Greeks. They, they had already considered this problem, but of course they didn't quite have the technology. Maybe they would have developed it if the Romans had left them alone. But you know, <laughs> right. they didn't have the technology to actually do a, a search. Mm -hmm. But now in the 20th century, that's become possible. I mean, not by you know, calling up Scotty in the engine room and you know, asking for Warp 7 to go visit the aliens. Right, that right. happens you know, essentially every night on the Sci-Fi Channel mm -hmm. and occasionally in the movies. Mm -hmm. That's not possible, but it is possible, at least theoretically, mm -hmm. that you could aim a big antenna mm -hmm. or a big conventional telescope at another star system and see signals mm -hmm. that were sent our way, either deliberately or accidentally. So mm -hmm. those are the things we look for, trying to prove that there's something else in the universe besides us mm -hmm. that's smart enough to figure out physics and some other things. Right. Well, it, yeah, there's a lot of philosophy that goes with that, too. I mean, being a physicist and astronomer, there's a lot of philosophy, as, as I c gather from your book. There's also the biology, and you talk about, you go, you talk about these, these, these subjects in a very methodical way, in which it, it makes you think. It just, it's actually quite fascinating. And I'm just wondering, how, how, have you studied biology in, in depth at all, or how do you... Um, <laughs> no, but, well, I <laughs> actually I had a couple of scholarships in biology. My mom was very happy about that when I was in high school. She thought, Is that right? you know, my son, the doctor kind mm -hmm. of thing. But it didn't work out that way. I wasn't, you know, couldn't stand the sight of blood <laughs> in a nutshell. But, but, but I, you know, I had some courses in biology. But actually, my my knowledge of biology is that of an interested amateur as well. Mm -hmm. However. The questions of biology, and for that matter, some other subjects like geology and even a, a little bit of chemistry are important right. if you want to consider the, the question of, well, could there be life elsewhere? Because right. obviously, if you're going to ask that question and have some hope of figuring out an answer, you need to understand a little bit about biology. So mm -hmm. you become a bit autodidactic. You, you learn yourself a little bit about, uh, about that subject, and I, right. I have done that at least. I see. Okay. Okay. And you've been at SETI for how long now? Uh, I uh, joined the SETI Institute in 1991, I believe. Okay. So it's been a while now. 91. Yeah. And apparently um, SETI th went through a funding, uh, the funding went away, and you talk about that in your book too, how I guess this, the Senate just at one point just, just got rid of it, didn't believe in, in the mission, but some private investors came to the rescue and it continues to, to survive. Now that's yeah. right. Uh, when I joined the SETI Institute, uh, the, the experiment to try and eavesdrop on these radio signals right. from uh, other civilizations, you know, right. uh, that was a NASA program being run out of NASA Ames Research Center. And uh, that's why, in fact, the SETI Institute was located here in Mountain View. Right. But uh, in 1993, there was a Senate amendment that stopped NASA funding of SETI. Mm -hmm. And this was done for political reasons, by the way. It had nothing to do with the science. Uh, there was a senator from, from Nevada who was looking for some sort of uh, device to show his, his <laughs> constituency that, you know, he was, he was saving the money in a, in, a, in a budget year that wasn't looking very, you know, very good. Mm -hmm. And so he was looking for things that he could kill that didn't have great political consequence, but that looked like he was getting rid of some boondoggle government project. So he picked on SETI, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he uh, forced this vote uh, late in the evening when there weren't too many people around, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was really a political thing. Mm. But that meant that we didn't have uh, any more NASA SETI project, and right. yet we had all this equipment. We were beginning to just, you know, start doing our observations, our, our data collection, mm -hmm. and uh, we were fortunate to be able to find some people, people whose names are familiar, like Bill Hewlett, David H uh, Packard, right, Gordon right. Moore, <laughs> Paul Allen. Uh, people Intel, who, Microsoft, yeah, uh, yeah, but these were the individuals right. who were doing this. These were checks from them, not from their companies, really. really. Wow. That uh, can have continued the project mm -hmm. with that private money, and today we continue to look for donors who find this an interesting thing to do. Exactly. Interesting. The, the thing, the, the premise behind SETI, there's something known as the Drake Equation, which I guess from what I gather is really the whole reason for its being. This, the, SETI, the SETI business revolves around what's known as the Drake Equation. And Drake is the, from, the, from a man named Frank Drake, who I guess is your boss. Is he, is he still, he's still there? Oh, most definitely okay. there, but yeah, he's not my boss, for which he's okay. thankful, actually. Okay. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, he's my mentor in many ways. I mean, he's kind of my hero, Frank Drake. Right. Yes, Frank, uh, Frank is still, uh, he was the guy who did the first modern SETI experiment in 19, 1960 now. It's been 1960. 45 years. Yeah, I'm sure that's hard for him to believe. Yeah.